Greetings and welcome to Ever Present. I'm Pastor Michael Mira. I'm John Spellman. We've been speaking about the Word of God for the last several episodes and speaking about God's presence in the Word. And we're going to continue speaking about this today. God has given us this wonderful gift, the Bible, His Word, and it is a gift that many have. Many have the Bible in their home, but not many take it seriously. There was a time when it was very difficult to have a copy of the Bible. But now that you can go to any bookstore and get a copy of the Bible, or you can order the Bible online, or there are digital versions of the Scripture, in today's day and age where, for, for the most part, it's not an obstacle to be able to read the Word of God, and yet, because of the skepticism of our time, and many of the ideas that people are accepting, so many are not even interested in reading the Bible. They do not believe that it actually contains the writings in the original form. They do not believe that counts therein. There are some who believe that the Bible is just a bunch of myths and it can't be trusted. And so for these and other reasons, so many do not take the Word of God seriously. And so for the past several episodes, this is actually episode number four in this series on God's presence in His Word, we are going to continue to explore and explain and enjoy speaking about the history of the Bible and its trustworthiness. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you are present with us continually. Your word tells us that you will neither leave nor forsake us. We know from your word that we are in the last days and that these are skeptical times as never before. And yet, Lord, history is replete with example after example to assure us that your word has not changed. You have given us your word. It is the same. The message is the same as it has been from when the writers wrote it. Because you have ensured through the working of your Holy Spirit that the message would be available for us today. And Lord, your word is under attack in so many different ways. But when we read your word and we open our heart to your Holy Spirit, we can experience your presence. We can experience you talking to us through your word. And we thank you for that. And we pray, Lord, for the viewers today to be blessed by this episode, your presence in the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the last time we were speaking, and we started speaking about some evidence outside of the Bible. And I wanted to start the program off today with speaking about a reference that the historian Edwin Yamuchi says is probably the most important reference to Jesus outside of the Bible. Reporting on Nero's decision, Emperor Nero's decision, to blame the Christians for the fire that destroyed Rome in 64 AD. The Roman historian Tacitus wrote that Nero, and this is, this is the, the quote I'm giving from the Roman historian, non-Christian, Roman historian Tacitus. And what he said is that Nero fastened the blame on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. He went on to say Christus, with whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hand of Pontius Pilate. A most mischievous superstition, again, broke forth, not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. And so he said, a most mischievous 
superstition again broke forth, and I, I, I um, omitted a certain part of the quote, a most mischievous superstition again broke forth, uh, which is right now held in check, basically is what he was saying, but he said it again broke forth not only in Judea, which he said was the first source of the evil, but he also said even in Rome itself. Now this is the essence of the words of Tacitus, a Roman historian. And so it's, it's, a, very important, um, it's a very important statement. It's a very important statement. So he said it, it was, so we see very several elements in this, in this, um, in this passage, basically, or this translation of this, this passage of the Roman historian Tacitus. Now, Tacitus is in the second century, and, you know, there are those who are skeptics, uh, they're skeptical of, uh, you know, this source. Edwin Yamuchi, the, the historian Edwin Yamuchi, who is, who is referenced in, the, in the, a book called The Case for the Re Real Jesus by Lee Strobel, he, he is interviewed and he, he speaks on this reference, you know, but in today's world, there are people who will say, well, um, well, there are some who will take the point of view and they'll, they'll actually say, the Tacitus is not contemporaneous to Jesus. And so uh, his words don't matter that much. They take that uh, argument. Now, the problem with an argument like that is, it's, uh, could I not write accurately on history that took place before I was born? I mean, there are those who say, well, I'm not contemporaneous to the things that happened in the 1950s. Could I not write accurately on things that happened uh, before I was born, and so this this Roman historian Tacitus, um, wouldn't he have access to information? Wouldn't he have access to information that we don't have available to us now? Wouldn't he know people? Wouldn't he have known people who maybe their parents or others who had known others would be able to pr provide information? Obviously, a, a, a historian who takes his discipline seriously. Um, would very much be able to access information that existed before his, he was born. So let's, and how would we know if a, if a historical work is valid? Well, let's say I start writing and I say, I'm going to tell you about events that took place in the 19th century. Let's say that I start writing about events that take place in the 19th century. Oh, let's, let's go even before that. Let's say I'm going to write about events that took place in the 17th century. And in my writings, I'm going to write them as though I lived in the 17th century. And then somebody discovers my manuscripts. They discover my writing. And now, if in those writings I start to say things that don't make any sense with what is known about the 17th century, let's say, for example, in the 17th century, there were people driving around in cars. Now, if I say that I lived in it, and then I start expressing certain realities that are anachronistic or that could not possibly have taken place in that time, a historian, a careful historian, taking his discipline seriously, archaeological evidence, other sources, would know, okay, it cannot be that this person lived in the 17th century. And so Tacitus, the, the historian Edwin Yamuchi, referring to Tacitus, saying that this is probably the most important reference to Jesus outside of the New Testament. Again, let's consider the quote carefully. Tacitus says that Nero, let's carefully think about it, Nero fastened the guilt on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace, Christus, with whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of of Tiberius at the hand of Pontius Pilate. A most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke forth, not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. So there's several points that are being made. Now he's saying there were Christians alive in Rome during the time of Nero. That's point number one. Christians were alive during the time of Nero. 64 AD was the fire. Nero is blaming the Christians. So there are Christians in Rome. We know the Bible speaks about the church in Rome. Again, we see that 
the Roman historian Tacitus says, Christus. Christus is the one in whom the name had its origin, Christ. So he's saying they have the name Christians, and they get that name from Christ. Then he's saying that Christ suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hand of Pontius Pilate. What was the extreme penalty? Crucifixion. And so th this is a... And, and then he says a, a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment again broke forth not only in Judea the first source of the evil. So he's calling it evil. So clearly this is not a Christian. He's referring to Christianity as evil. But he's attesting to the fact that Christianity broke forth or it emerged out of the very place where Christ lived, Judea. And, it's, and it was also in Rome. Now that's a very important um, historical evidence. Now th there are some who will, again, they will discredit it for uh, the reason of saying it's not contemporaneous to Jesus. This is a silly criteria, just as it would be just as silly for me to say I couldn't write accurately on events before I was born. So Tacitus is in the second century, and these events happened in the first century, and there would be no source of information. Like every, uh, you know, that, that would invalidate every single uh, person's account of, uh, you know, their family life or the history of their family and their grandparents right. prior to them being being born. We would have to call all that into question. Right, right. So let's say I write about events that happened in the 1950s, or I write about events that happened in the 1930s, and it, it, my life was not in the 1930s. But do I have a grandmother? I did have a grandmother. I knew a grandmother. <laughs> you know, I knew my grandmother growing up, and she was born in 1905. So I had grandparents who could tell me about some of those things. But just because I'm not contemporaneous, I wouldn't have any connection to that at all. There wouldn't be other writings. There wouldn't be other sources of information. And let's say somehow all those other sources disappeared, and all that was left was my writing. Although I might have not been contemporaneous to the events, my writing would still have credibility. And so um, the historical disciplines would help to reveal whether or not a, a piece of writing was authentic or not. And so the, to say that, well, it's not contemporaneous, that doesn't, that, so it doesn't count. This is a silly kind of argument, but there are those who will say that. They'll say the same thing about Josephus. They say, well, his account, uh, and as the last episode, Dr. Paranello had referenced a, a quote from Josephus, and there are two quotes in Josephus, but they use the same type of argument then. Another type of argument would be, well, um, okay, I'm going to accept that this person wrote it. Well, I, I might not want to believe that this person is contempt or, or not, th this person is not contemporaneous to Jesus, but... Um, I'm willing to accept that his, his, his writing may be valid. This is somewhat of a skeptical point of view. However, the earliest copies that we have of his work are so far removed from his actual writing. In other words, he wrote in the second century, let's say for example, so Tacitus writes in the second century, and let's say, I'm, then I'm just making this, uh, making this up as an example, but the earliest copy that we have of his writing is from the fourth or fifth century. And so we can't trust it. Now some might argue in that way and say, well, the earliest copy we have of the writing of Tacitus, the earliest copy we have of Josephus, or we might talk about Pliny, or another source. And we say, well, the er yes, they, they're making reference to Christians and Christ, but the earliest copy we have it's long after they wrote. Well, how does a historian determine whether or not that writing is authentic? Again, using historical disciplines, using what is actually written in the work, using archaeology, they would determine, okay, does this piece of information actually demonstrate a genuine knowledge of the period of time it claims to have been written? So again, these types of arguments that are advanced, the type of argument to dismiss, to dismiss the writings of Tacitus, which the historian Edwin Yamuchi said, this is, this is probably the, the most important reference to Jesus outside of the Bible. To dismiss these writings, that's something that's commonly done, but it's not something that should be done for the reasons which I've explained. 
I've also explained in the last one of the last episodes that we have so many references to the New Testament in the writings of the church fathers from the first century to the eighth century Clement to John of Damascus and so if all of the manuscripts we had for the Bible if somehow all of them were destroyed the Bible could be reconstructed, the New Testament rather, could be reconstructed through the references of these church fathers alone. So there is such a wealth of manuscript evidence for the Bible. I referenced again this man named Daniel Wallace. Now Daniel Wallace is a scholar, textual critic. I have a wonderful debate of him and Bart Ehrman. You might actually be able to, to see it on YouTube, I'm not sure. But Daniel Wallace and Bart Ehrman. Now Daniel Wallace is a textual critic, Bart Ehrman is a textual critic. So these are high scholars in textual criticism, looking at the manuscripts, deter how, determining how can we be, how can we faithfully uh, replicate what was in the original word. And D Daniel Wallace holds true to the authenticity of the scripture, and Bart Ehrman doesn't. Daniel Wallace, as I mentioned, he is heading a, 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 an organization, or he has a website, called the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, and where they are actually digitizing, where they're actually digitizing these ancient manuscripts. And so you can go on there, on the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts website, and you can actually study and look at and try and, and I mean, they're in ancient languages, but you can actually start to read those things. And so there is so much evidence to show that we have the Bible. You know, some people will say, oh, the Bible is just copies of copies of copies of copies. That's, a, that's very easy to say. Some people will say it's just copies of copies. It's like the telephone game. You know, you get, you get, a, you get the, ten kids in a row, and you whisper something mm -hmm. in that kid on the end. You whisper something in his ear. And then he whispers it to the next ear, and then he whispers it to the next one, and they whisper it to the next one. By the time you get to the end, you have something totally different than what was said. And some people will actually, in ignorance, and I, I don't blame them because, sadly, oftentimes these are the things that are told to them and they don't know. But some people think of the Bible as, as being produced that way. And it is not true. The copies that we have of the Bible use ancient manuscripts. They're not just making copies of copies, and there are thousands of ancient manuscripts. That's right. Uh, some dating, uh, you know, back to before the first uh, century A.D., uh, you know, in regard to the Old Testament and in regard to the New, we have some uh, pretty old manuscripts. So it's not like, you know, something that was produced over the last couple of years. Right. Right. Uh, I mentioned P52, which is the earliest manuscript that I know, Papyrus 52, that Daniel Wallace sp speaks about. And one of the points I made in the last episode was in um, 1840, F.C. Bauer, the scholar, was saying that the book of John was probably written 170 A.D. Now, obviously, when you read the Bible, you realize, no, John must have been in the first century A.D. And that is the consensus of conservative scholarship. John was the was the last author of the scripture, and he was writing in the first century A.D. Well, if F.C. Bauer is going to say, well, no, it, probably the Gospel of John is written in 160, 170 A.D. This is what Daniel Wallace is relaying. 160, 170 A.D. Well, that, would be, that couldn't have been John that wrote it. Couldn't have been John that wrote it. But then, Dr. Daniel Wallace said, with the discovery of P52, that destroyed that whole theory. And so he, he spoke about four scholars, one in particular said this P52, this manuscript with certain portions of the Gospel of John may even date to the end of the first century, the very century where John lived. So, that, so the manuscripts, starting at P52, the manuscripts go right back uh, at least to the second century and dealing with events in the first century. Now somebody might say, well, okay, so you have manuscripts, uh, big deal. Well, Again, I'm referencing Dr. Daniel Wallace because he has very powerful arguments. He said, for the average Greco-Roman piece of li literature, let me show slide uh, number two. Do we have slide number two? I believe last week we showed slide number one, and if we were able to show slide number two. Okay, so here's this, the average... Well, wait, let's make sure we have audio. I just look for confirmation of audio. Okay. 
Okay, so here we see the average classical Greek writer has less than 20 copies of his work that still exist. So here is, uh, here is what we see here. Um, let's look at the next slide, slide number three. Okay, so Daniel Wallace, he did a presentation where he has basically a stack about four feet tall. And that stack of four feet tall, it represents the amount of manuscript backing for the average Greco-Roman historical work. About 15 to 20 copies, that's about four feet high, a stack of about four feet high. Now, these works, the earliest manuscripts, again, the earliest manuscripts we have in them. In other words, if they were written in one century, they, let's say somebody wrote in first century A.D., but we might not have his original copy. We have copies of his work maybe in second or third century A.D. I mentioned to you that in the Bible, with the Bible, P52 may even go back to the very century of John, if not to the second century, so very close. But what about these average Greco-Roman works? When do those manuscripts go back? How far do they go back? Well, according to Daniel Wallace, they're about 700 years removed from the original. 700 years to 1800 years. So we have a stack of about 15 manuscripts for the average Greco-Roman work, and the uh, and, and, and these manuscripts are, are the earliest copies of them about 700 to 1800 years after. That's, a, that's an incredible distance. And yet, with the Bible, this is an important point. If we were to compare the, the stack of manuscripts for the average Greco-Roman work with the stack of manuscripts we have for the Bible, Daniel Wallace said, okay, here's that four foot tall stack for the average Greco-Roman work. Now, with the Bible, comparatively, it would be like stacking four and a half Empire State buildings on top of one another. We have about 25 to 30, or rather 20 to 30,000 manuscripts of the Bible. 25, or rather 20 to 25,000. 20 to 25,000. Now, compare that and going all the way back to the beginning. So if you say that the Bible isn't true, that I can't trust the Bible, I might as well throw away all of ancient history. Let me uh, just clarify your argument. For those of you who are new, you might be wondering why exactly are we talking about all this manuscript evidence and how many of uh, these type of manuscripts we have versus how many of these type of manuscripts that we have. So let me just see if I can break this down for you in a really simple and easy to understand format. Basically, the argument is this. If somebody's going to say... How do we know that what the Bible says is actually what the original writers wrote? Because, you know, since we have copies of copies and so forth, how do we know that we can trust that the copies are accurate and reflect the original? All ancient works are copies of copies because the original writings that were written are, are no longer in existence. The reason why is because when you write something down on, let's say, a piece of paper, I mean, back then there were no computers. So when you write something down on a piece of paper, over time, that piece of paper is going to biodegrade. You're not going to be able to keep it intact. I mean, if you have an old book from as far back as maybe 100 years ago, you'll probably notice that the papers have turned brown and, you know, they're really um, uh, flimsy and will probably break apart the moment you touch them. And that's why when you go to a museum and you look at some ancient work or ancient painting, they won't even let you touch it. They don't want you to cough on it. You can't even look at it or take a picture of it with your phone because they're just afraid that something is going to happen to that piece of work or to that art, or to that, uh, to that paper. And the reason why is because paper over time biodegrades. They did not have computers back then, or typewriters and things like that. So, the original of any work is most likely not going to be found. Mm -hmm. Whether it be the Bible, whether it be an ancient historical document, uh, unless it was like carved in stone, you're probably not going to find it because paper will degrade over time. So, Obviously, to preserve writings, what people did back then was they made copies of the original, and they kept making copies and copies and copies and copies and copies. Now, if a person says that the Bible uh, can't be trusted, then you have a problem, because when you compare the manuscript evidence that we have for the Bible to any other ancient historical work, we have by far more evidence for the Bible than we do any other ancient historical document. Take, for example... Um, the uh, Julius Caesar's uh, Wars, I think it's called, mm -hmm. right? There are only a few manuscripts, 
and they're 700 years removed mm -hmm. from the original time when that book would have been written. Mm -hmm. So in other words, um, you have a, 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 the extant documents that we have are copies of copies, but yet nobody questions whether or not uh, that, that work was written by its original author. Mm -hmm. When you have the writings of Plato, Socrates, and all the ancient philosophers that we all learn about in school, uh, especially when you're, in the, when you're at the college level, all of the ancient manuscripts of what those individuals wrote are all hundreds of years removed from the time that the, the, uh, the individuals like Plato or Socrates or whomever might have written them, or Aristotle or any of those guys, right? So, but nobody questions whether the works of Aristotle were really written by Aristotle. Mm -hmm. Nobody questions whether or not the works of Socrates were really written by Socrates, even though all we have available to us right now are copies of copies. Mm -hmm. The reason why we have copies of copies is because, obviously, the original documents were written on paper, Paper biodegrades, so naturally, uh, the original uh, manuscript of what Plato, Socrates, or Aristotle would have written would no longer be in existence because it would have deteriorated over time. However, people were careful and they copied these manuscripts and they made more copies of the book and they distributed it. Mm -hmm. And if there were an issue with these copies of copies, you would see differences in the manuscripts from one select group of texts compared to another select group of texts. But nobody ever questions the works of Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, Julius Caesar's work, or any of those individuals. Amen, yes. But yet, we'll question the Bible. Now here's why that's a contradiction. Because if you're going to say we question the Bible, some of these books, these ancient manuscripts that are not biblical, have only a few copies, like mm -hmm. 15, they're 5. Far removed, right? Yeah, they're far removed, right? But yet the Bible, we have 30,000 copies. Sometimes more, some scholars yeah, say... Like 20, 25. Yeah anywhere from 25 to 30,000 copies of these books, all of which agree. Mm -hmm. So how can you have agreement among all these manuscripts, but yet say, uh, oh, well, you know, we can't trust the Bible? Right, if, right. if there were there, there were problems in terms of the copies, if people were copying different things here or there, then we should see huge discrepancies between what man, one manuscript says compared to what another manuscript says. Mm -hmm. But yet, when you look at the history of, of biblical manuscripts, you don't see that. Right. Right. So the problem that you have is not only do these manuscripts all agree, all 30, 000, 25 to 30,000 copies of them, not only do they agree, but they're also closer to the original documents than any other ancient source. So whereas with some of these ancient philosophers, they're 700 years removed, we have biblical ma manuscripts that trace as far back as perhaps the first century. Right. Uh, so when you look at that, and you then say the Bible could have lost meaning through translation, you basically... You might as well just throw out all of history, and yes. we don't know anything about anything anymore. Yes, yes. And, th and that's very well put the way John uh, explained it. I realize that this is some tedious information, but John explained it very well. That, that's, that's really very important to understand, uh, because time and time again, people are buying into these arguments mm -hmm. without really understanding the issues involved. Um, you know, I mentioned in the past, this, or even just now, this uh, skeptic textual critic, uh, Bart Ehrman. And he's part of, he mentioned that he was part of the Society of Biblical Literature, and he said there's thousands of, of Christians in there, thousands of Christian scholars. Now, he mentioned this when he was um, <clears throat> receiving, I believe it was, I listened to two interviews of him, he re was receiving uh, an award from the Freedom From Religion Foundation. He's receiving it. This is Bart Ehrman. He wrote Misquoting Jesus. He's a textual critic, but he's skeptical of the Bible. And so he was receiving an award from the, from the Freedom From Religion, an atheistic uh, foundation, receiving it from them. And uh, he was also, and you can see this on YouTube if you look it up, that, that video is on YouTube. And also another video where you can actually hear audio of him being interviewed on an atheist um, uh, radio show. And what was interesting is on both of these presentations the same issue came up because there are some atheists who are so radical in their thinking that they will say, oh, there's no evidence that Jesus even existed. And here Bar Ehrman in both cases had to correct them. He said, look, there is, I know thousands of historians and none of them say Jesus didn't exist, and none of them say that Paul, for example, didn't write Galatians. And right. when he was saying that, the atheistic uh, uh, host of the show was basically <laughs> kind of taken aback. Um, and when he was receiving the presentation from the Freedom from Religion Foundation, again, somebody said, well, how do we know that Jesus... And he said, look, uh, we know he existed. 
and we have historical evidence for that. And one of these historical evidences would be the writings of Josephus or the writings of Tacitus, or we could talk about Pliny. Um, mm -hmm. And one thing he did, which I think was, was commendable, is he actually, in his own way, he chastised the audience and he said, look, when you take that argument and you say that Jesus... Now, Bart Erdman, keep in mind, he's not a Christian. And so he's saying Jesus existed. I may not believe he was the Messiah, but I believe there was a man, Jesus, and he existed. Who lived and walked on earth. And lived right. and walked on mm -hmm. earth. Now, these, now he said to, these, to, these, to this audience, he said, when you take the argument of the mythicists, which are those who basically deny that Jesus historically existed, the whole thing is myth, he said, when you take that argument, you make yourself look foolish. He was saying that to atheists. I'm giving him the award. And so, you know, um, we have to be aware of these realities because... Um, it, yes, go ahead, yeah, I was going to say, it's important for us to understand the historical nature of, 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 of Jesus being on earth because, I mean, there are some people out there who may not be believers who just make any and every argument, whether it makes sense or not, to try to justify why they don't have faith or why they can't believe in the, in the, in the Bible. Uh, but yet, when you look at people who truly are atheists who have actually studied the subject, uh, and may not believe as we do, but yet, even they wouldn't come to the conclusion that Jesus never walked on earth. They may not believe that he did the miracles, they may not believe that he's the Messiah, but they don't deny that histor the history records that Jesus actually was on earth. Yes. Yeah, and it was interesting because I went, uh, I was doing some research and I went on an atheist website, and the atheist en was enjoying the work of Celsus. And Cel Celsus was somebody who was basically a, a skeptic of his time, attacking Christ and attacking Christianity, but even he, and this was the thing that I thought was interesting, where some of these atheists will take the point of view that Jesus never existed, and so here's an atheist quoting from Celsus, but Celsus assumed that Jesus existed, and he even in his own way was attesting to the fact that Jesus worked miracles, but he was saying he was a magician, he was a charlatan, he was just doing tricks, so, but, but when you look uh, at the basics of what he was saying, he existed, he tricked a lot of people, that's his, that's his assessment, he was a magician, but he existed and he must have performed signs that Celsus decided to interpret a certain way, but he never took the position and said, no, he didn't exist. So when you look at these early references, you'll see references to Jesus, you'll not see any reference, for example, that says the body of Jesus was found. And that's another important point when considering Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a point brought out, and there's a, there's a, a book called uh, uh, The Third Day by Hank Hanegraaff. It's a small book, and it points out these, these different points, um, the fatal torment of Jesus, the empty tomb of Jesus. Now, asking uh, Bart Ehrman about that, and Bart, Bart Ehrman, again, well, why, if you believe Jesus existed, <coughs> and you at least believe some of the Bible, and you believe Paul wrote, and obviously... Um, well, why don't, uh, and how would, the question is, how would Christianity have even gotten off the ground? According to Tacitus, as I mentioned in that quote, Tacitus is attesting to the fact that this most mischievous superstition broke forth, not only in Judea, the very source of the evil, the very place where Jesus lived. He's saying that's where Christianity started, the very place where Jesus lived. Well, the question is, well, to someone like Bart Ehrman, well, how could it have even gotten off the ground? What would have compelled many, many Jewish people to have turned uh, against the, the, the position that their nation had officially taken in the Sanhedrin? To say, look, we're not accepting this. What would have compelled so many? Because the disciples were and Jewish. And to die for it. And to die for it. What would have compelled them to do it if they knew the body was there? if they knew the body was there. Now, it was very interesting what Bart Ehrman said in response. Bart Ehrman said, well, I believe Jesus was crucified. We have evidence of crucifixion, but I don't believe there was an empty tomb. And what was Bart Ehrman's reasoning for that? He said, well, the, the common practice of the Romans was to leave the body hanging on the cross for many days until the body decomposed. Because part of the crucifixion was to not give uh, a, a rightful burial. So they'd leave that body on the cross for many days until it decomposed and then cast it into a common grave. Now brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. Uh, if that body was up, on, they expected, the disciples were saying, he was going to rise on the third day. 
Right. And if that body was still hanging up there, rotting on the cross, and everybody knew that, why wouldn't we have documentation from the enemies of Christianity saying, look, the body was on the cross, it was rotting, and it was thrown in this grave? None of that. But even beyond that, it may be true that, as Bart Ehrman said, it was the common practice of the Romans to leave that body up there for many days, but the Bible explains why it didn't happen in this case. That's right. What was the reason? That, uh, you know, uh, Joseph of Arimathea uh, mm -hmm. asked Pilate for the body. It was, uh, it was the, basically uh, the time of Passover, and they didn't want to leave the, bi the right. body hanging on the cross, uh, you know, during the Sabbath, yes. uh, which would have been, you know, so the, the Passover feast had just finished, and then they didn't want to, it was the high, it was what's called the high Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was the one time a year where you had Passover and the seventh-day Sabbath that both occurred on the same day. So the Jews considered it taboo or unholy to leave a body up there on the Sabbath. Amen. They asked that uh, the body be thrown into the common grave earlier, and Pilate released the body to Joseph of Arimathea, who put it into a tomb. That's right. So, so the Bible is telling us why the normal... Now remember, there was a lot of tension between the Jewish nation and the Roman nation. And right. it, The Romans it, didn't even want to put Jesus on the cross. That's right. Pontius Pilate didn't want to. And that's another historical detail. Pontius Pilate had him flogged. And again, according to that little book, uh, The Third Day, Hank Hanner uh, points out some interesting details. There's also another book, um, The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, The Case for the Real Jesus, I pointed to again. And it, within these references you discover, there have been eyewitnesses of people who had been flogged. The way the Bible, now the Bible says it in passing, he, uh, he was flogged. Pontius Pilate didn't want to have him crucified. But do you realize, and it's just a, a quick statement, but if you understand, the Roman flagrum, that whip, it had metal pieces at the right. end, metal ball bearings, that would tear through muscle, that would tear through ligaments, and there, were eyewit there was an eyewitness account, I remember reading, that said they, that somebody had been flogged, this person had seen this person who had just been flogged, and even their intestines were exposed, because the flogging would tear through the body. So one historical reason to explain, they wouldn't, it wasn't a common practice to flog someone and then crucify them. See, Pontius Pilate had Jesus flogged because he didn't want him to be crucified. Yeah, he's and, actually trying to save his life. Yeah, so life. by having him flogged, maybe if the people saw what, what it was, what had happened to him, they might turn away from having him crucified. But all of the blood lo lo loss from the flogging and then to have the crucifixion, that's another reason why it was the early uh, death of Jesus, although we would say that he died of a broken heart. But just from a historical point of view, the flogging, the tearing apart, the blood loss, and then hanging up there in the sun like that. Because crucifixion was basically a way to uh, suffocate a person. You, you, you were on the cross, and then you had to push up to get your breath. Breathe, and then yeah. you go down. And after days, been, then some of them would be up there for a long time, days maybe, on the cross, pushing up. When they no longer had any strength, they would die. But what was it? So, as John pointed out, it was the Passover, and the Jewish leaders wanted the bodies removed, but Jesus had already passed away. He'd already died. But what was it that the Roman soldiers did to make sure that the other two crucified victims would die right away? They had to break their legs. Break their legs. In order so that they couldn't push up anymore to get breath. You see, and so the Bible is describing, and that's another indicator of its authenticity. These are details that historically were not known for a long time. It wasn't known for a long time. These mm -hmm. intimate, the intimate knowledge of first century Palestinian life and the details of crucifixion have been verified by archaeology. Now, Bart Ehrman points to that, and he says the body was left, must, would have been left up there. No, the Bible says no. And it explains why it wasn't. And then the another, another question, the appearances of Jesus. The appearances of Jesus. As we read, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15 and starting verse 3. Let's take a look there. 1 Corinthians 15 uh, from three, 3 to 8. Uh, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then, the, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto the, this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. 
And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. Amen. So here we see an early Christian creed, and, and Paul is saying, but Paul is using the word delivered. And it is understood, and this is another point that has been commented on. He received this. This is an early Christian creed that Paul received. And it is dated from three to eight years after the crucifixion. After the crucifixion. When did Paul receive this? In other words, I've received it. I'm not just coming up with this. This is what I received. And this very simple Christian creed is telling us several things. It's telling us Jesus uh, died for our sins. He was buried. Third day, he rose again. Empty tomb. And he was seen by many. Now, Bart Irving said, well, what can account for the um, what can account for these eyewitnesses, uh, these eyewitness accounts of the resurrected Jesus? You know what Bart Ehrman said? They were hallucinating. Come on. <laughs> well, that's what he says. He said they were hallucinating. He says it's very common for a person, if you had a loved one, to hallucinate and see them, and to see them after they died. But here uh, was the fish a hallucination. Jesus ate fish when he rose again. When Thomas touched his hands. The apostles were there. I mean, 500 brothers and sisters, and they're all hallucinating, and they're all seeing the same things. And so these are the kind of things that really make us understand that in order to deny the Scripture, you have to deny history, and you even have to deny common sense. And so let us consider um, this idea of the telephone game. You know, people say, well, the Bible is a result of the telephone game. According to the apologist Greg Kokel, no, it's not linear. It wasn't a linear transfer. It was a geometric. I want to put up a, a couple of slides. Let me put up slide four. And um, let's see slide four. Okay, so this is, again, showing the distance. Pliny the Elder, earliest copy they have of his work, 700 years later. Plotarch, 800 years later. So this goes to the point I made before of these Greco-Roman works, the earliest copies we have being 700 to 1800 years removed. Look at that mm -hmm. list. Josephus, 800 years. And yet these are works that are taken seriously by historians because when they read them and what they know about these periods of time, what the works attest of the self and also archaeological evidence reveal these are trustworthy works and yet removed far after. Let's look at the next slide. Okay, the manuscript evidence. 1611, number of manuscripts we've had there. Seven manuscripts. Now 2000, Greek manuscripts. Now 2013, 5,800 plus. Actually, as I told you last time, the last count I had, 5,856. Again, tons of manuscripts for the Bible. So uh, let, us, let us consider the other thing. Greg Kokel, he said it's not a ma it was not a linear transfer of information. You know, in other words, it wasn't somebody writes a scripture, then somebody copies him, then somebody copies him, then somebody copies him. No, it would have been somebody makes a copy. These right. copies were in demand. You may get five copies made from one copy. Then each of those five copies, five or ten from each of them. And so they were, they were a large number. It just wasn't just one or another. That's why Greg Kokel put it that way. Not another, just one after another, but geometric. And another thing to consider, too, is that the author would have probably made several copies of the, you know, right. like as he wrote the original, then he would have made, uh, you know, several copies, I guess, of the original and distributed it and so forth. So there are several original copies yes. that were distributed, and then, of course, the copies were made from that. Uh, and yeah. So when you have the, all this agreement amongst all these copies of manuscripts, that's impossible and then to turn around and say, oh, well, maybe they've lost meaning through translation. I mean, in order to suggest something like that, you'd have to have uh, massive differences between these manuscript copies. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's consider uh, a very good way to illustrate this, found in the book of The Case for the Real Jesus by Lee Strobel. And so on page 81, he had, he, Lee Strobel interviews these different scholars. And as I mentioned, one of the scholars is Daniel Wallace that he interviews. Daniel Wallace says, for, for years I've been duck, conducting a seminar called The Gospel According to Snoopy. And so he said, I've done this seminar uh, over 50 times at the time this book was written, which was several years ago. And he says, I've done this seminar many times. What I do is I get the, the people together, I get uh, some of them, a, a group of them, to play the role of scribes. So I'll give them a document of 50 words, 
and they'll all come together and they'll start copying that document. There'll be enough of the scribes there to produce maybe six generations of copies from that original. And when they're making those copies, there'll be mistakes made and so on, but it'll be a reasonable copy enough to, to get the idea of what the original says. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on to say that from a 50-word document, you probably get 100 variations. You know, they could be misspellings, maybe a wrong word. Those are the variations, differences there. You get 100. The next day, he will have the rest of the members of the seminar play the role of textual critics. What do they do? They try, they take these copies... And they tried to assess, by looking at all of them, by comparing them, what did the original say? Now part of it, part of this experiment, is to make it replicate what has happened in real life. So he'll actually have the original copy destroyed. Now obviously, uh, Daniel Wallace, who's conducting the seminar, will have the original copy. But for those who are taking part in it, they'll destroy the original copy. They'll even destroy chains in the, in the links. Of, from one generation to the other. So they'll, they'll destroy. So maybe you have the second generation, but you don't have the third generation of copies. Maybe you have the third, but you don't have the fourth. So they'll destroy, they'll destroy some links in the chain. And these people, in, and, and again, keep in mind, Daniel Wallace said at this time, he'd done this about 50 times, in about two hours, these people, who are not textual critics by discipline, just ordinary people like you and me, they will be able to replicate the original. He said that they will be able to replicate the original but maybe one, maybe one to three words off. And he said they were only off three words once. But the original message was always intact every time. And he's been conducting this seminar. So clearly, clearly, if we have 20 to 25,000 manuscripts of the Bible going back to the second century, then how can we say we don't know what the Bible says? And the other thing, too, I forgot to mention this earlier, that those copies of manuscripts that we have, that, are, that we still have available, not only do they agree, but they're also in different locations. Mm -hmm. So remember that when the Bible was first being uh, introduced to uh, you know, what we now think of as modern-day Europe, uh, it was spread all across those different territories, around Asia Minor, certain, part, uh, certain parts of Africa, uh, parts that we now call Europe. And when you take, like, let's say the Coptic uh, Gospels, you take a look at the, the Peshitta, which is Arabic, when you take a look at, uh, you know, the, uh, the Latin, the, the Old Latin Vulgate, when you take a look at all these different versions that were copied into different languages and spread and, and rotated and copied and copied and copied, when you compare that and you take a King James Version or whatever version and you, uh, and, and you sit there and you open up your Bible and if you're able to translate... I've actually used Google Translate to do this. So I've actually taken Google Translate, copied portions of the, of the Peshitta, had the Arabic translated, then looked at my King James Version Bible, and saw that clearly they're both saying the same thing. I could actually tell what passage I was reading. Amen, amen. You know, God is, we've been talking about some of the um, scholarly details about the history of the Bible, but you know, the Bible is our defense. God, and we 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 have just demonstrated we've been demonstrating the Bible is trustworthy. The message has not changed because it is important. God has given it to us as a light. Psalm 119 verse 105. The word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. But it is our defense when we look at that that spiritual armor in the book of Ephesians, chapter six, and we and we consider that from from 13 to 18, we read about the sword of the spirit. The Bible is the sword of the Spirit. We talked about Jesus during the temptation. He defended himself with a thus saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. God has given us the Word. God has, G Jesus is the Word. The Bible says in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. God is a God of communication. The Bible reveals he spoke everything into existence. You know, not only is the Bible the communication of the Word of God, but the Bible also has principles by which we can benefit on how to communicate rightly with one another in the book of Proverbs and other areas. Let's turn to the book of Proverbs, uh, 15, verse 1. Which says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. So you might be having a friend who's a skeptic. You might have somebody who doesn't believe in the Bible. However you speak to them, we've given you lots of information and leads for you to continue studying on this matter. But always remember, a soft word turns away wrath. A harsh word starts anger. Let's, let's look at Proverbs 29.20. 20. 
which says, See, Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words? There is more hope of a fool than of him. Another important principle. Don't just let your words get you in trouble. Think before you talk. Mm -hmm. Let's look at uh, Proverbs 10.19. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. You see, so the Bible is not only a book that is the actual communication of God, but it has principles on communication that we need to learn from. Let's take a, a look at another one. Proverbs 13.3 He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life, but he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. Amen. So we, we can see over and over... The Bible is telling us to be wise in how we, we talk. Mm -hmm. Amen? How we communicate. Let, let's look at uh, Colossians 4, verse 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with, with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Amen. So again, we are seeing that in the New Testament as well. Let your speech be seasoned with salt. Everything you say have something in it, some way of glorifying Christ in everything you say. Uh, another one is um, the book of Matthew, Matthew 12, and verse 36 and 37. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. You know, if we've received Christ into our life, Christ is the Word made flesh. Our words should change. And it is by our words, as you can say, as you can see right here, we shall be justified or condemned. And I just want to show a few more of these to, to bring out this principle clearly. Let's look in uh, Luke. And um, let's look in Luke 6.45. A good man out of, the, out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth the, that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For, uh, for of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. Yes, yeah. so the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you have Christ in your heart, it's going to show with your words. It's going to show with how you speak, talking about speaking. We've been talking about the Word of God, God's presence in His Word, but God wants to be present with, with, with us in the way that we speak, especially in the world we live in today. Uh, let's consider James, the book of James 3, 2 through 6. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able to also to brittle his, the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their, their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which, which though they be so great, and are, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the, the governor listed. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Yes, so you see that in verse 6 it says, and the tongue is a fire. So we have to tame our tongue, the Bible is revealing. This can only happen through the Holy Spirit. As, it, as the word says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's going to come out of you, so we better make sure that we have the right, the right person, the right one in our hearts, Jesus Christ. You know, we, li we live in a world where people don't know how to communicate, especially in this day and age, politically and socially, people are at odds with one another. Mm -hmm. Another very important principle, James 1.19. Let's, let's look at that one. Well, I can say, James 1.19... This is your favorite. Yeah, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. You know, the Bible is very clear. Let's look at uh, 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So we have to speak. We have to be prepared to speak the truth. But we have to do so with meekness and with fear. And let's turn to one more. I know I'm giving you a lot of work, John. But let's turn to uh, Ephesians. And let's turn to chapter 4 and verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is, in, which is the head, even Christ. Amen. You know, sometimes when we're talking to someone and we disagree with them, 
Sometimes what happens is you don't actually hear the person, you hear the interpretation of what they're saying, your own interpretation, rather than what they're saying. But the Bible is revealing, we have to speak the truth in love and we have to be quick to listen, slow to speak. And so truly genuine listening is so vital for communication. It may even be more important than the words you say, to know how to listen to a person. Yeah, and one of the things I think that's, that's brought out in this lesson is as we're talking about uh, the history of the Bible and how all these things, people may be saying, okay, what does that have to do with God being ever-present? I think that when you, when you look at the history of the Bible and you look at these messages that we have uh, from, from God and you look at how uh, we're told to communicate in, with other people as well as how God communicates with us, I think one of the crucial points is that God hasn't left us alone. He's still trying to communicate with us today. The problem is that we're not listening. Amen. And God's word has been preserved throughout time. We have here a revelation from God, but yet we don't use it, and we're not listening, and we're not we're, we're quick to form opinions, but yet we don't really listen to what God is telling us. Amen. So it's not that God doesn't want to be involved in your life, or not that God doesn't want to be present in your situation. It's that, are we listening? Mm -hmm. And when God speaks to us, do we want to hear what God has to say? A lot of times we reject the Bible, not because it truly can't be trusted, but simply because we don't want to, we don't want to hear what God has to say because it might disagree with how we want to live or what we might want to do. So the important thing in, in recognizing God being present in your life is to listen, to, is to have a heart that's willing to listen to God yes. and being open to God. So, I mean, history has shown that the Bible can be trusted. It, uh, I mean, yes. we saw the manuscript evidence that the Bible is more reliable than any other historical book. We saw how uh, it hasn't lost meaning through translation. The copies of copies all agree with each other. Uh, even in different languages, it still agrees with each other. We see all these different things that show us that the Bible is what it, said, what it, you know, what it claims to be. It's, it's been preserved, uh, and, it, and it contains um, messages to us on how to live amongst one another as well as how to relate to God, but yet it's in every bookstore and nobody's really reading it. That's right, and, and it's clear that the... So we've seen that the Bible is trustworthy, We've seen that it is the Word, and it reveals the Word made flesh. So this is the written Word, but Jesus is the Word made flesh, which the Bible testifies about. And we, when we receive the truth, the Bible says the truth will set you free. Jesus says you, the truth will set you free. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he goes on to say, I am the light of the world. So you have the opportunity with the Word of God to know the truth. And if you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you as you read the Word of God, you will be transformed and He can use you to be a light to others in this dark and skeptical world. Well, thank you very much for joining us on today's episode of Ever Present. Please join us again. Let us close with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the blessing of your Word. We thank you, Jesus, for coming and exemplifying the love of the Father to this world for being the truth and for making the truth personal to us, Lord. There is clearly no argument and no valid reason for rejecting your word, Lord. We have, Lord, in these recent presentations of Ever Present sought to defend your word and to show that it hasn't changed and to do away with many of the skeptical and confusing arguments that are being made so that by your grace the listener and the viewer is left with the impression that there is no excuse for not taking your word seriously. We thank you Heavenly Father for all of your blessings and we praise you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming everyone. God bless.